Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. This is Radio Free Mormon on the air, broadcasting behind enemy lines. Tonight's episode The Dan Lafferty Interview from the year 2000. On July 24th, 1984, Dan Lafferty brutally killed his sister in law, Brenda Lafferty, and his niece, 14 month old Erica Lafferty. Dan Lafferty killed them both in order to fulfill a revelation that his brother, Ron Lafferty, said he had received from God. The story of these murders is currently being broadcast on the Hulu Network in a seven-part series starring Andrew Garfield titled Under the Banner of Heaven. The series is based on the book of the same name written by John Krakauer. On the 16th anniversary of the murders, reporter Tom Barberry was able to gain access to interview Dan Lafferty while he was serving his sentence of life imprisonment at the Utah Department of Corrections, and where Dan Lafferty continues to serve his life sentence even today as of 2022. I need to put a trigger warning at the beginning of this episode. It should be clear by this point that what is going to be talked about are two grisly murders of two completely innocent individuals, including a 14-month-old child. If you do not want to hear Dan Lafferty relate how he committed these murders, then turn this recording off now. Go no further. What follows next is Tom Barberry's interview of Dan Lafferty. Play the tape. Affairs Network. This is Feedback with Scott Winter on the Spectrum Public Affairs Network. It was one of the most infamous crimes in Utah history. It involved politics, religion, and the family. It was the brutal murder of Brenda Lafferty and her 14-month-old baby, Erica. Good morning, I'm Scott Winner, and this is a special edition of Feedback on the Spectrum Public Affairs Network. Brenda Lafferty's brother-in-law, Ron Lafferty, orchestrated her murder and the killing of her daughter after he says he received a revelation from God. The brutal slaying was carried out by his brother, Dan Lafferty. This last July, Call 910 AM Radio's morning show talk host, Tom Barberi, had a unique opportunity to talk with Dan Lafferty on the 16th anniversary of this crime. This special edition of Feedback is a rebroadcast of that live telephone interview from the Utah State Prison. Now, Tom's original interview with Dan Lafferty was over 80 minutes long. This version has been slightly edited for time, but not for content. And we have with us on the line Dan Lafferty, who is out at Point of the Mountain and a convicted murderer, for those of you who don't know want to ask you, first of all, uh, you did not dispute the fact that you committed this act. No, no, I've explained that. In fact, with uh, certain events that have taken place, I felt like it was the proper time to uh, begin to talk about it. I guess, coincidentally, it's fallen in a harmonious uh, relationship with what Mike's doing. Uh, but yes, I've spoken quite clearly about it now. You, uh, you committed this act how long ago? Uh, let's see, I think it's been 16 years ago yesterday. 16 years. And the, for those who are not familiar with the Lafferty case, you uh, slashed the throats of your sister-in-law and niece. That's correct, yeah. Walk us through, when did the idea first occur to you and your brother that these two individuals should be murdered? Well, the simple answer to that is that it came through a revelation my brother received, but it has so much more uh, background <clears throat> that leads up to that, essentially... Go ahead, take your time. All right, let me see if I can sense kind of what uh, may be of interest here. Uh, uh, I came from a background in the LDS Church, and uh, in due course, I saw myself evolve through some interesting uh, changes as uh, my personal life evolved. Uh, I served a mission for the church. I later went to college to become a doctor, like my father was. And I think when I returned back from California uh, is when I began to see some of the major changes that began to happen in my life. I became a member of the uh, uh, attacks revolt group when I uh, was upset over the way... Uh, my efforts to support my family while I was going to school was mm -hmm. I was confronted with some obstacles with government and that have made me quite upset and in the process I started looking at ways to uh, 
satisfy my confusion, and, I, and that's when I think I saw myself begin to first of all step out of mainstream Mormonism. About mainstream what age? Everything. About, about what age were you then? I uh, probably would have been about right around thirty years old, I think. And you were not young. You were you're an adult. Uh, yes, I was an adult. I was a little older when I finally went back to school, and that I had my years of. Uh, what did? Let me ask you this. What did um, having difficulty understanding why you had to pay so many taxes? What did that have to do with your religious change of direction? Okay, to tie that together, ultimately it was that that led me to being excommunicated from the church. And my excommunication then led to uh, my fundamentalist investigations, which ultimately culminated in these events, which opened the next chapter of my life, which is prison. This is Radio Free Mormon inserting myself into the interview, which unfortunately I'm going to have to do every five minutes or so in order to make some commentary. I will try not to break up the flow of the interview too much, but the reason for this is that I think this is a very important interview for the public to hear. It has been out of circulation for two decades now, as far as I can tell. We have made efforts to contact Tom Barberry and the producer of the show on which this was broadcast back in the year 2000. Those efforts have been unsuccessful. But nevertheless, I would not want this interview to be flagged for copyright violations and therefore I want to make a few comments along the way so it will qualify as fair use. Having said that much, it does appear that this recording, this interview, originally occurred on July 25th in the year 2000. I say this because Dan Lafferty has just identified yesterday, i.e. the day before the interview, as being the 16th anniversary of the murders. The 16th anniversary would have been July 24th, 2000. The day after would be July 25th, 2000. Going on with the interview. Was your brother with you uh, every step of the way in this this conversion and this change? No, he wasn't. Uh, During my political uh, issues, during the uh, time that I was involved in the uh, tax revolt issues, and uh, ultimately I ran for sheriff, seeing the significance of having... uh, a constitutional type sheriff, convening common law juries, and I won't go into a lot of unnecessary detail there unless someone's interested in it, but uh, during that time, my brother Ron was uh, embarrassed by the things I was doing. I remember as I campaigned for sheriff, I was in the uh, Utah County parades and that, which are going on this time of year, and Uh I remember he was quite embarrassed by all of that. Why was he embarrassed if you're running for sheriff? I mean, running for sheriff is a, is a noble goal. Well, it wasn't a conventional uh, campaign. Uh, okay. I was stirring a lot of... Uh, uh, anyway, I was stirring up a lot of uh, commotion, and uh, it wasn't conventional. But it was about that time that Ron, my older brother Ron, uh, kind of at the behest of his wife, came to try and straighten me out. I, I really should say us. What what was happening was I have four younger brothers also who I guess possibly because they look up to me as an older brother or something, they were curious at least about my activities and, and as a result philo- your philosophy and politics at the time. Right. And were drawn into it to some extent and and it may have appeared to some people who were having meetings and things to try and resolve these things, but uh, there was nothing organized in, in any form, but apparently, for some reason, Ron's wife took a, a personal uh, interest in what we were doing, and, and not a positive one. And at a certain point, uh, she uh, basically instructed him to come and straighten us out, so to speak. Well, he came one day to the office where my uh, where we happened to be meeting, uh, talking about these kinds of things, and. Uh, and he tried to straighten us out, but we said, fine, if you can, that's all we're trying to do is straighten our own minds out. So if you have something you can add to what we're doing, you know, it looked like, well, in any case, he said, well, it, from what it appears, it looks like uh, what you're doing is right and, and what everybody thinks you're doing is wrong. And So up until this time, he was not a big supporter of what you were doing, but then that's after right. chatting with you about this, he became a, a like mind of yours. That's when the change came for him, yes. Okay, now how do we move from running for sheriff to uh, a religious conversion or, or shift of gears, if you will. Okay, his change of mind led to his and mine and one other brother's excommunication, which followed quite shortly after that within a matter of not very long time. And what, really. did, what did you do to uh, to uh, get excommunicated? Well, what they told me, I 
the, the explanation or reason given for my excommunication was conduct unbecoming a member of the church. I was told specifically by the council that uh, held my excommunication court that I was... Uh, uh, I wouldn't be excommunicated if I would conform and quit doing things that were embarrassing to the church. Like what? what Specifically, obey the law was the de was the quote so you're, words they used. And I said, well, I think I am obeying the law as I understand it. So what laws did they think you were breaking? Okay, well, uh, I was challenging licensing laws. I was challenging... Uh, mm -hmm. The regulations that made me feel like they were violating the free agency issues, which I picked up from my growing up years in the church. Like I, having to have a driver's license? Yeah, those things. I had returned my driver's taxes. license. I had returned my marriage license and a lot of those things. I saw licensing as a, uh, a means of control by government. So once you were excommunicated, uh, did... Did you confer with your brother about uh, what was going on, and, and did, was he of like mind to you to uh, follow this other path? No, it's very fascinating to, it's fascinating for me to reflect on these things, in fact, as you bring them back to my mind. As with so many things in my experience, there were coincidences, if that's, I use coincidence probably a little different than most people, it's kind of a coinciding of events that take place that are quite fascinating, but I, by no effort of my own, I began to be approached and uh, by people who were fundamentalists. Uh, I don't have any idea how they knew who or where I was. Uh, I was living fairly privately after these things. I was uh, had lost my practice and I'd, lo I'd moved away from where I had been known in that. I was pretty remotely located. But Do You say practice and I don't want to digress here, but your profession at that time was? What? I was a chiropractor. You were a chiropractor. Okay, right. now... This is RFM again, breaking into this interview briefly to let you know how it was that I came into possession of this interview. A listener to the show whose first name is Jerry. I won't mention his last name. If he wants to mention his last name, he's free to do so. But Jerry contacted me and let me know that he actually personally recorded this interview when it broadcast on the radio back in the year 2000. He recorded it with a cassette tape. He sent me the cassette tape, which I was then able to convert into an MP3 file so as to format it for this podcast. I want to thank Jerry for sending this to me. This is an incredible interview with Dan Lafferty. Tom Barberry does a sensational job in the interview, and I want to give him kudos, too. Now, let's continue with the interview with Dan Lafferty. Uh, when you say uh, they found, people found you, what kind of fundamentalists? Uh, particularly at this time, uh, polygamists, I think, would probably best, although that usually if they're involved in polygamy, there's a number of other fundamental issues that are usually involved, but polygamy probably would be the best way to... They wanted you to join their organization, or...? Yeah, they did. It seemed like, at least, to give me an opportunity to begin to evaluate <clears throat> fundamental issues, which prior to that I had never allowed myself to think about because of my uh, commitment to the LDS Church. When did you and your brother become uh, cohorts, I should say, or, or, or followers of the same path? Uh, by this time, Ron had become involved, as I mentioned earlier, uh, to a certain degree, but I met two or three different people who were involved in the polygamy movement, and I started visiting with them, asking questions. Now, about that time, another coincidence was a gentleman from Canada, whose name was Bob Crossfield, uh, came, uh, well, we, we met him, and he said he'd been sent by God. He was claimed to be a prophet, sent by God. He said the name God had given him was Onias, by the way, and he'd been sent to meet with us specifically, according to uh, his explanation. For what purpose? To set up the School of Prophets. A School of Prophets? Yeah, now that probably is what I, your, uh, that's essence, in the essence, an answer to your question where it got involved in, uh, mm -hmm. the School of Prophets was established anyway, and a number of us were ordained prophets in that school, and uh, during that time, well, according to uh, Anias, that was uh, the, one of the purposes of it was to teach uh, us in the school how to receive revelation. What revelations did you have then, if any, and, and how did your brother uh, come to uh, involve you in this, this act? Okay. I, like I say, I never did have any revelations before that, and the revelations, maybe this is kind of what you're hoping to lead to. I'll just kind of 
feel along here as I go. Sure. The revelations got fascinating and interesting, and then Ron began to receive a revelation that he was that was scaring him. I could see it was. Mm -hmm. And uh, each person who received a revelation, they'd kind of work with it. If they were interrupted, it just would pause, and they'd pick up after they finish whatever. It's, it's quite a fascinating phenomenon in any case. But You would do this in the presence of others, or would you do this in the privacy of your, yourself? Either and both, apparently. Okay. And uh, that's what made it so fascinating. Uh, like a person, <laughs> I remember one time, uh, uh, one of the people were asked, have you received any revelations lately? And he says, well, I got a half one here, and he pulled it out of his pocket. And uh, I, I said, a half one? He says, yeah, well, I just got interrupted by a phone call or something. And I'll uh, get the rest of it here as soon as it's quiet again. So you can put a revelation on hold if the phone rings? Apparently so. And oh. that's fascinating. To now, me. your brother uh, was involved in the School of Prophets, too, I understand, after a period of time. Uh, Ron? Yeah. Yes. Once we became uh, connected, so to speak, with the events that I told you about earlier, mm -hmm. he, he and I pretty well remained uh, connected from that time up until we were separated by his, uh, when uh, I came into prison and he went to the hospital with a... Uh, uh, he had a suicide attempt, and right. that separated us. We've never been back together since then. You're listening to a special edition of Feedback on the Spectrum Public Affairs Network. I'm Scott Winter. Acting under the belief that Ron Lafferty was a prophet of God, his brother Dan murdered Brenda Lafferty, their brother Alan's wife, and her 14-month-old baby Erica, because Ron had said that God wanted them killed. We continue this special edition of Feedback, a rebroadcast of Call 910 Radio's Tom Barberry's interview with Dan Lafferty. Now, as most students of Mormon history know, the idea of having a school of the prophets was not original to the Lafferty's. The school of the prophets was originally instituted by Joseph Smith in the 1830s when the saints were located at Kirtland, Ohio. The school of the prophets generally met during the winter months when there wasn't as much work to do for the men. They would gather together and have lessons in which among other things, they studied history, current events, reading and writing, mathematics, and doctrinal teaching, including the lectures on faith, which were originally given and taught during the School of the Prophets session in 1835. And it was in the 1836 session of the School of the Prophets in Kirtland that they hired the services of a Jewish rabbi named Joshua Satius to instruct the participants in Hebrew. Going from the LDS Church's own website, under Church History Topics, School of the Prophets. In December 1832, Joseph Smith received a revelation directing him to establish a school for the elders of the church in Kirtland, Ohio. Joseph Smith and his contemporaries used the term School of the Prophets to describe this new school. This term was commonly used to describe the seminaries at Harvard and Yale, as well as other schools at which clergy received training for their ministry. So it wasn't even unique to the Mormons. For some, the name called to mind the Old Testament company of the prophets, which gathered around such figures as Samuel, Elijah, and Elisha. And Elijah will figure prominently later on in the interview with Dan Lafferty in a perhaps surprising way. Take us, take us through the process when Ron comes to you and says, I had a revelation and uh, you have to go kill your sister-in-law and niece. Okay, it was never like that exactly. He, he received this revelation and I he came to me, actually, trying to find some con consolation, I guess. He, he said, I'm receiving a revelation that's frightening me. And I said, well, does it f seem the same as the ones you've had before? I didn't want to pressure him or make him uncomfortable in any way. And uh, I determined that he felt like he was receiving it in the same way. And I says, well, when you feel comfortable, you can talk to me about it. Uh, and in, a due, in due course, he told me that it was talking about taking lives. And I says, oh, my, that is, uh, that is heavy. I can see why it's concerning you. Uh, all I can say is just continue to be as sensitive and careful as you can be. Don't, uh, uh, don't err on the side of care either. You don't want to offend God by not being willing to... Uh, accept what he's telling you at the same time don't tip over the other side either and in due course he told me about this revelation where it said that it was talking about removing uh these two individuals who had become obstacles and uh we it didn't say who was to do it or anything at that time and uh, when we took it to the School of Prophets, as we normally did, that shattered the school. That was 
too much for anyone in there to handle. When you revealed the revelation that Ron had at the school, uh, did, were you specific about who the victims were going to be and the means by which they would be killed? Uh, the means by which they would be killed, no. The specifics of the individuals were listed, yes. But and did, did they question your sanity? Did they ask yes. you, you know, why would why on earth would you do this? Right. That that was part of the question that was in their eyes, obviously. And later in the trial, I could see that even people who claimed to be willing to do anything that God wanted to do... See, sometimes I, I've, I noticed that there are a lot of people in the world who talk but really aren't serious about they, what they say. And... I saw that to be the case. I was surprised. I was as surprised to see their response as they were to hear the revelation. Among a number of things that are hard for me to comprehend about this story is the fact that this revelation that Ron Lafferty said he received, which designated people who were to be murdered because they had become obstacles to the cause, and that specifically listed were Brenda Lafferty and her 14-month-old baby, Erica, that this revelation was taken to other individuals in the School of the Prophets and shared with them. And even though this revelation apparently broke up the School of the Prophets because it was too much for them, yes, I can understand it being too much for them, but the thing that I cannot comprehend is that nobody, not one of them, contacted police about this matter. If one of them had had the guts to do so, this whole tragedy might have been averted. So while it is obvious that some of the latent violence in LDS history may have lain at the root of this horrible act, it appears that the systemic culture of secrecy within the LDS church may have played a role as well. But when it came right down to it, it never was something I anticipated doing. If you'd like, I'll explain what I consider one of the most uh, most phenomenal days of my life was the 24th of July in 84. And the 24th, I understand, has great significance, so if you would uh, do that and tell us about the 24th. Okay. We spent the prior night at my mother's home, and on um, the morning of the 24th, Ron was saying basically that today is the day, and uh, He'd been talking about this revelation quite a bit leading to it. Uh, he seemed to see some significance. I, I tried to be careful not to influence him or uh, anything, but he seemed to make, be making implications that 24th of July was an important day and it was going to coincide here with uh, this event. And I ultimately it did, obviously. But the way it came out is we, uh, around noontime, we went to American Fork to uh actually we talked about going there to pick up one of my father's guns from my younger brother alan who was uh whose wife and child were listed to be whose lives were to be taken and uh so we drove to american fork and on the way i was praying and wondering if i should be uh, involved using this description I gave to you earlier, and I felt that it was the right thing to be doing, so I tried not to let myself get emotionally uh, uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. uh, when we arrived at the house, at some point at least, I hope this is not offensive to Ron, uh, I'm, he made a statement uh, to the effect, I guess we shouldn't ask someone to do something that we're not willing to do ourselves, and Ron left the car and went to the door of the house, the apartment there where my brother and his family lived, uh, with the intention of fulfilling the revelation. And uh, he knocked on the door several times, very loudly, uh, and I was sitting on the, in the car at the curb in front, waiting and watching and praying. And uh, I remember my prayer at that time was uh, specifically, I... If this is your business, God, that's fine. If it's not your business, you better be involved here and you better let us know. I'm willing to, if you'll guide me, I'll go whichever way is right or wrong. I don't want to do what's wrong, but I don't want to offend you by not being willing to do what's right either. Those were kind of... Uh, and you were, was, prepared, you were prepared to commit murder at that point? I was, absolutely. And uh, secretly in my heart, not secretly, but I was thinking, the thought at least came into my mind, per, hopefully... It's just a test. And the longer he knocked without an answer, the more this thought came to my mind, perhaps it's a test, like it was for Abraham, who was willing to take his own son's life. And when my brother turned around with a perplexed look on his face, he returned to the car, and I was thanking God that it was just a test, like Abraham, 
Ron got back in the car, and I said, well, I guess we may have passed the test. I was driving the car, and this is when uh, what I can only describe as the most peculiar phenomenon took place, and we began to drive away from the, from this, uh, the apartment and got about two blocks away when suddenly I was overcome by a strong feeling, is the only way I can describe it, to turn the car around and to return to the apartment. It didn't make much sense to me. And I've tried to describe this, and I, when I've tried to describe this, the few people I've tried to describe this to, they become confused by it. And I have found the easiest way to describe what I was experiencing is to quote from the Book of Mormon when Nephi was describing his experience of taking Laban's life, where he was clearly feeling the directions but wondering if it was right. Now, different than with Nephi, I didn't resist in any way that feeling. Here Dan Lafferty references a story that is told at the beginning of the Book of Mormon, a book that Mormons consider to be scripture on par with the Bible. In the story, the hero, whose name is Nephi, is directed by the Spirit of God to kill a man named Laban so that Nephi can get the records of his people, which are written on brass plates. When Nephi stumbles upon Laban, it is in the middle of the night, it is in the streets of Jerusalem, and Laban is passed out drunk. Nephi then gets the revelation from God that he has to slay Laban, and he does so by taking Laban's sword and cutting off Laban's head with it. In the story, there are several times that Nephi resists the divine command to slay Laban, but ultimately Nephi relents and murders Laban in cold blood. Dan Lafferty tells this story as partial justification for his slaying of Brenda and Erica, but puts himself in a light better than Nephi at least better in Dan Lafferty's point of view, because Dan Lafferty says that whereas Nephi resisted the divine direction to kill, Dan Lafferty never did, not once. Now, how long had you driven away from the house? How much time and how much distance had elapsed before you had this? Just moments. I was maybe two blocks away. The car, we drove in the same direction the car was facing, so it was uh, uh, however long it takes to drive about two blocks. And I said, I've got to go back to the apartment. But... Being led by the Spirit is the only way I can describe this. So I, being led by the Spirit, I drove back to the apartment, stopped at the apartment, went to the door, and first knock, the door was open by Brenda. Uh, who knocked, you or your brother? I did. I went alone. Everyone else was in the car. I'm, so I'm they, being led by the Spirit now, and nobody else really knows what's going on except me and God, I guess, is the way to describe this. And so you, they stayed in the car. You went to the door, knocked. Brenda opened the door. Right. Brenda opened the door, and I just pushed... Went, I felt led by the Spirit to enter the house, and I kind of had to push past her to do it. And uh, I just continued for the next probably 10 minutes or so. I don't know how long it took. It was kind of, uh, I was just basically led by the Spirit. There was some conversation between Brenda and I because I obviously had intruded. She made some statements that were quite revealing. And uh, What kind of statements? And she, she Did she wonder what you were doing there? Uh, yeah, well, it was even more bizarre than that. She, I remember one of the statements that uh, she made. She said, I knew that you were going to do something that no one could stop. And I thought, well, that's curious. Uh, she said, uh, she started making a lot of apologies about uh, things she'd done. She'd been very involved in trying to break up our families and things. Uh, she was I, married to your brother, younger brother. Yeah, she was married to my, to my youngest brother. Where was he when this whole process was At the occurring? time, he was working in Ogden. It was a holiday, I know, and there's been question whether he was involved, but he didn't. He wasn't involved. And he, Did you ever discuss with him your revelations? Yes, I had. I had told him about it uh, a couple of months earlier. Uh, Did he express any uh, dismay, the fact that you had revelations that were going to take his wife and daughter's life? Yes, he did. He, uh, but I felt, I felt prompted to tell him about it. It just seemed like the right thing to do. And the moment I remember it was in my father's house when I did it, and it was just the right moment for it, I guess. Ron was with me when it happened, and I, I said, Alan, I just feel like I need to tell you that Ron has received a revelation that talks about taking your wife and your child's life. And his reaction was? He was quite shocked, obviously, and but he knew what we were involved in. He knew we were involved in serious issues with the School of Prophets and things, and he made a comment uh, without quoting him specifically to let me know that he was 
concerned about God's business and wanting not to offend God. And I was very impressed by his... He uh, didn't go off the deep end and try to do everything possible to protect the life of his wife and baby from his brother who was bent on killing them? No, he didn't go off the deep end, if in, as you may be describing it here. What essentially, let me try to describe what happened. He made a statement that let me know that he wanted to do what God wanted. He wanted God's business to be done. But he said, now you also must understand, he says, I will defend my family with my life. If you were to try and fulfill this revelation and I was around, you'd have to take my life too because I would defend my family. And I said, I understand that, Alan. I don't... I just feel like I should tell you. I don't know why necessarily. I don't know that this will ever happen. I'm just telling you what I know at this point. And uh, I this, presume... This, did not, this, this conversation did not get heated in any way? He no, didn't, there was no heat. He never all. showed uh, a great passion for uh, the safety of his wife and baby? No, it didn't get heated, but it got emotional. There were tears involved. I'm just trying to understand, Dan, as you can well imagine being a, a, a husband and a father, if, right. if a relative or anybody came to me and says, I have uh, a notion to kill your wife and baby, that uh, there would be no end to the emotion that was going to be displayed. Well, he's a special person. That's all I can say. The first thing I want to say is that I am absolutely sickened by Dan Lafferty talking about Brenda after he had pushed his way into her house, obviously bent on violence. Brenda could tell it. Anybody could tell it in that situation. And Dan Lafferty says that Brenda began to apologize for a lot of things. Now, Dan Lafferty is taking that as, oh, Brenda has done a lot of bad things. She's committed a lot of sins, and so she's apologizing to Dan sincerely because Brenda has been an obstacle. She realizes now that she's been an obstacle, and she's apologizing for being an obstacle. I'm seeing it as someone begging for their life and for the life of their baby. So that's one thing. The other thing is that Alan Lafferty, Brenda's husband, knew that she was marked for murder, knew that his own daughter was marked for murder, and did nothing about it. All he said was that, well, if I were there when you tried to do it, I would have to protect them and I would lay down my life for them, thus signaling, of course, to Dan and Ron that when they went to the house to murder Brenda and Erica, Alan needed to not be home. And that was obviously part of the plan because Dan just got done saying that it was a holiday, it was Pioneer Day, it was July the 24th, 1984, but that he knew that Alan was away from home working in Ogden, Utah. He knew that Alan was not there. He knew the coast was clear. He knew the time was right to commit the murders. And Alan never did one damn thing to stop it. So you're in the, in the uh, apartment with Brenda and your niece. Okay. How long did you have a conversation with her and how did it degenerate into a murder? Um, we... I don't know how many detail, how much of the detail. I, I've gone into the complete graphic detail with uh, with Mike King and and the others and uh, those who he has uh, had me share this with for their purposes. Uh, by the way, I've never misled them. I haven't. <clears throat> uh, I feel that there's a purpose for sharing all this, and I won't go into. I won't digress into that right now, but. Uh, I, he suggested perhaps it wouldn't be necessary or maybe appropriate to give some of the details. In no, the, I don't think that's necessary. I think uh, everybody knows the details. I'm just trying to understand how long did you carry on a conversation with Brenda before you murdered her? Okay. It wasn't long. It was probably a matter of maybe a couple of minutes or so. And, well, the whole scenario continue unravel. I'll go through it as much as I feel like uh, go ahead. There's nothing I'm ashamed to describe to you. It's just that I don't want to offend the sensitivity of who may be listening, and more than they maybe already have been. I don't know. I'll just I'll just feel my way through this. I it's should a little be able late to for that. Since yes. what I <laughs> well, all right. Well, maybe I'll just uh, spill it all to you then. Go ahead. Okay. Well, uh, as I stood there and she talked to me, I felt inclined to hit her, and I did. I hit her as hard as I could. I intended to knock her unconscious. Um, uh, my thought was if I knocked her unconscious, then she wouldn't be, have to suffer when I took her life. 
Uh, she was knocked unconscious, in fact. In fact, all it did was made her talk more, and she revealed a lot of fascinating aspects about her personality, which I wasn't that particularly concerned about. I didn't particularly like or dislike Brenda. I didn't know her. She avoided me because she didn't like me, I tell you, uh, to be honest with you. And uh, as a result, I didn't really know her. I didn't know the child. And maybe that's okay in the end anyway, but... Uh, she began to talk about all the things that she was doing to create, uh, uh, to try and break down our families. For whatever reason, she made that her personal issues. And I thought, well, I'll be darned. I'm surprised that a lot of these things people were saying are true, that she was uh, more mischievous and deceiving. And uh, It never occurred to you that she thought you were nuts? That who did? Brenda. That she thought I was nuts? Yeah. Oh, I'm sure she thought I was nuts. So that didn't in any way uh, shape your mind thinking, well, there's a reason why she's saying these things, because she thinks I'm crazy. Uh, no, I don't think I ever allowed myself to... Uh, at this point, certainly I didn't. At this point, I could tell I was involved in doing something that I wasn't going to let anything distract me from. I was mm -hmm. kind of... Uh, just being led by the Spirit is the best way to describe it, and I... So when you killed her... Uh huh. What was your feeling immediately upon committing I, that act? I didn't experience any feeling. I Okay, I'll explain to you a little more. Accompl I, I, was it accomplishment, relief, remorse, uh, oh, no, it was, second uh, guessing? Was, what, sure. was there anything that went through your mind at that instant when she lied there dead that you had done something right, wrong? Oh, yeah, accomplishment. Now, maybe I could best catch that by telling you what... At a certain point, Ron, I guess, it became a little heavy for Ron, and he suggested we leave. This was before I'd taken her life. So he and came into the apartment. You told me in the beginning that you were there alone. Right, okay. Let me back up. I think the best way to answer your questions is to go on and, and pick up where I left right. off. and go ahead. And finish it. Okay, so I, I struck her, intending to knock her unconscious. Unsuccessfully, she continued to talk about things. So I took her, and I threw her on the ground and uh, held her. <clears throat> At that point, it was right there by the door. Uh, Ron came, apparently they could hear me throw her on the ground, and uh, Ron came to the door and had to push his way in. And he uh, asked me what uh, was going on, essentially. I was, I was actually holding her down, and I, I said, I'm just following the directions I'm being led to do. And he says, well, what do you think you're going to do? And I says, well, I'm going to take her life. And he says, how are you going to do it? I said, well, I'm not sure yet. Let me... Uh, pray about it here and I'll tell you and I said I'm going to take her life I'm going to cut her throat and he says how are you going to do it what are you going to use and the, what he meant by that was I had a buck knife on my on my uh, belt that I carried with me all the time and uh, he had a, a knife which was actually the knife that was used and uh, I said I'm going to use that new knife that you just purchased and uh, he took it out of his boot and set it on the floor by me uh, as it continued, at that point, Ron, for whatever reason, began to, uh, well, I don't feel very comfortable going to that. Essentially what happened, short time later, Ron said, let's just get out of here. And I turned to Ron, I says, Ron, you do what you feel like you need to do. I'm going to do what I feel like I need to, and then I'll be ready to leave. And I think that kind of answers that. So essentially what happened, ultimately Brenda passed, that she fainted. And when she fainted, I didn't want her to regain consciousness because uh, that was, had achieved what I intended to avoid her having to suffer more than was necessary. And uh, so I wanted her to be uh, kept unconscious, and I tied a, a cord from the uh, uh, vacuum cleaner around her neck to keep her from regaining consciousness. And then, being led by the Spirit, I went back to the back bedroom and where the baby was and walked into the baby's room. I spoke to her briefly and then took her life. And then I returned to the kitchen where Brenda was and I untied her neck and took her life. And then I turned to Ron and said, okay, let's go now. I don't know what he was doing in between time, but then we left. And I did feel a sense of accomplishment. I didn't feel uh, uh, any, it wasn't, emo it was cold-blooded. It was a cold-blooded killing. Throughout Dan Lafferty's description of the double murder that he committed, he keeps using an expression, I was led by the Spirit. I was led by the Spirit. I was led by the Spirit. At every step 
of the way. The thing that is chilling about this is that this is another reference to the story in the Book of Mormon of Nephi killing Laban. The story says that Nephi went to Jerusalem by night. He needs to get the brass plates. He doesn't know how he's going to get those brass plates from Laban, but he went into the city and was led by the Spirit every step of the way. The exact language from 1 Nephi chapter 4, verse 6, Nephi, writing in first person, states, And I was led by the Spirit, not knowing beforehand the things which I should do. Verse 7, Nevertheless, I went forth, and as I came near unto the house of Laban, I beheld a man, and he had fallen to the earth before me, for he was drunken with wine. And when I came to him, I found that it was Laban. Verse 10, And it came to pass that I was constrained by the Spirit, that I should kill Laban. And then finally, after several verses of Nephi resisting the admonitions of the Spirit to kill Laban in cold blood, verse 17 states, And again, I knew that the Lord had delivered Laban into my hands for this cause, that I might obtain the records according to his commandments. Therefore, I did obey the voice of the Spirit and took Laban by the hair of the head, and I smote off his head with his own sword. It is that phrase from verse 6 of 1 Nephi chapter 4, and I was led by the Spirit, that Dan Lafferty continues to say over and over in recounting this story, making the link directly in his mind to the story from the Book of Mormon, which serves as a justification for his murders. What did you think was going to happen after these murders occurred that you committed? What did you expect? Uh, Here again, I have to refer to my personality, whereas I don't really much care about things that happen. When I sense something is correct, I'm really not that concerned about the consequences, even like when I came to prison, ultimately. When they were bringing me to the prison, there were people threatening my life, and the people of the news media turned to me and said, does that frighten you that they're threatening your life like that? I said, no, it doesn't frighten me. It's just uh, whatever happens. You know, I, I... not ashamed of what I've done, and uh, I really don't care what people say or do or think. I really care about doing what's right. What so, did you, you said you had a feeling of accomplishment. What uh, was the motive? Why did these two individuals, as opposed to any two other individuals on the planet, or ten individuals, deserve to die at your hand? What did you accomplish? That is a major question that I have only been able to answer satisfactorily uh, more recently. At the time, I certainly didn't have answers to it, and those questions ran through my mind and were asked to me by other people who I communicated with, although I didn't really talk to too many people ever, for a long time at least, but I wanted that same question. Ultimately, now I think I know answers. Uh, I think it was important that I came to prison. That's part of the answer. Then you might ask, why was it important for me to come to prison? You could go to prison by doing any number of things without murdering a child and her mother. That's true. That's true. So what did you accomplish? Why did these two people have to die? In your mind, why were they singled out to die? Other than because I believe God wanted it, I think you want an answer besides that. Because I am convinced, I'm, I'm of the belief still, that it was something God wanted. But why? It's, it's a bigger question, and it's not something you can answer so simply, but I will try and uh, get around it for you here if I can. And... You're listening to a special edition of Feedback on the Spectrum Public Affairs Network. I'm Scott Winter. On July 24, 1984, Dan Lafferty, acting on a revelation supposedly received by his brother Ron, brutally killed his sister-in-law, Brenda Lafferty, and her 14-month-old baby, Erica. As we continue this rebroadcast of an interview on Call 910's Tom Barberi Show, Tom asked Dan Lafferty by phone from the Utah State Prison, what was the reason for you to commit these murders? The answer to that question is because these events are all preparatory and they had to be of a magnitude that would get such attention that they would be important for what they are preparatory for. And And that's really what it's all about. And that would be what? Okay. Uh... It's difficult for me to talk about this a little bit because I don't like to sound presumptuous, but because of I've since learned who I am and what uh, I'm to do, I believe, that is, uh, will make all of this really small potatoes. And what would that be? Okay, 
I've come to believe, to understand, that I'm Elijah, which is just a title. It's uh, the Elijah referred to in the last two verses of the Old Testament that uh, will be instrumental in turning hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers in preparation for the second coming of Christ, which hopefully is drawing near. And these are all just things that are of a magnitude that would uh, weigh in with the magnitude of that kind of an event. And that's really the, uh, the capsulized answer to that. So, but I'm not sure it's that what is what you want. Well, no, I wanted your answer, and whatever that is, is is. Uh... Mm -hmm. Here Dan Lafferty explains that he did not have any idea as to why it was that God wanted him to kill Erica and Brenda, although he's previously stated that the reason is because they had become obstacles. They were an obstacle of some sort. They were interfering with the goals of the family, and therefore they had to be put out of the way. Now, in this interview, 16 years later, that seems to have changed somewhat in his mind. Now he does not know why it was that they had to be murdered, but instead he has learned since going to prison that actually he is Elijah, and that the murders must have been done so that he would go to prison, and they must have been done in some way that he has no idea what it is to help him fulfill his role of Elijah. Now, Elijah in Mormon theology is a very significant character. It is also an office, as Dan Lafferty mentioned. So he's not just a person, a character from the Old Testament. It is also an office which can be filled by multiple people. But what Dan Lafferty said is that his role as Elijah is to do something as prophesied in the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi, that Elijah would return and that his return would have something to do with the turning of the hearts of the children to the fathers and the turning of the hearts of the fathers to the children in preparation for the second coming of of Jesus Christ. Now this prophecy about Elijah from the book of Malachi is well known to all Mormons. It is frequently quoted by Mormons, but generally applied to the appearance of Elijah to Joseph Smith in the Kirtland Temple in 1836. And it is generally understood by Mormons to be an appearance by Elijah in the temple to confer on Joseph Smith the keys necessary to seal families together forever. That is the common Mormon understanding of the appearance of Elijah. Obviously, Dan Lafferty sees himself as another fulfillment of this office of Elijah. And indeed, the idea that Elijah is an office is also part and parcel of Mormon theology. So it, it, it required you to take this life, these two lives, mm -hmm. to create, what, something in the public eye so you would become known? I think that has to be considered as part of it, yes. Why, why do you have to be known for murder? Why couldn't you be known for uh, speaking your mind as to what you feel is coming? Uh, only because I believe that's God's plan, his strange plan, he, I must uh, <laughs> agreeably uh, admit. Uh, he says he has a strange plan, a strange uh, uh, purpose, and uh, this is very strange. But I believe that I see it now that uh, hopefully soon, and perhaps this, <clears throat> this uh, forum today is in some way significant to beginning to uh, prepare for the calling of Elijah, which is essentially uh, is an, es an essential work that has to be done before has to be done before Christ returns. Now, to, to get known for what you did, did you immediately go and turn yourself in and call uh, uh, Chief Cooper and say, no. "I committed these murders," or did you have to get caught? Uh, we were caught. Uh, if, if you were on the lam, I thought this was supposed to be something to garner you attention. Why didn't you stand outside and proclaim what you did? Why would you go and hide? Well, we weren't hiding. In fact, ultimately we did. Uh, I was basically following what Ron felt led to do at the time. But and didn't Ron tell you it was time to get out of there and not commit the murders? And why did you go forward with it? Oh, well, that's, that's a very fair question uh, and pretty insightful question. I don't know that I could describe it in enough detail to satisfy that, uh, there are, <clears throat> well, I'm going to tell you this now. Ron was an important instrument involved in the whole issue, but Ron is not uh, that important, ultimately. I don't know how, quite how to couch this. Uh, 
I told him, so I'll, maybe it's time. Maybe it's time to be more frank about this. Uh, Ron, I've told him, and I'll make it now public, uh, more so. Ron, in my opinion, is the son of perdition, and uh, he's doing the work of his father, and I'm doing the work of my father, and they we have different fathers, and so perhaps at that point things began to. Uh, uh, well, Ron fulfilled an important part. He he had things. Without Ron, it wouldn't be as it is supposed to be. But then again, the way I can maybe best, if it's not too presumptuous, help you to understand what I'm saying, <clears throat> Christ would not have been crucified had it not been for Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot played an important role, but he was the son of perdition. Christ identified him as such. And I believe Ron is the same. He played an important role. And the most common question immediately would rise to your mind, well, how would God use him as a prophet if he was... In a similar way, why would God use Judas Iscariot to receive, uh, to, to do God's business? But that God works in strange ways. So John, I do believe, though, essentially, is a son of perdition, and uh, his purposes are pretty much past, I believe. So here we get a remarkable insight into the mind of Dan Lafferty, at least as his mind was back in the year 2000. He knows in his mind that God wanted him to commit these murders. And so now he has to come up with some kind of rationale as to why it was that God commanded him to commit these murders in light of the way that things played out for the past 16 years when he is serving a life sentence in prison. Ron conceives of himself as Elijah, who must perform a great work preparatory to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Unless Ron gets out of prison, he can't perform this great work. Unless he performs this great work, Jesus can't come again. And therefore, he is expecting at any time for Jesus or God to come give him a helping hand to get him out of prison. He has also come to see his brother Ron as being a son of perdition. He says that Ron has one father and that Dan has a different father. What he means by that is that Ron's father is the devil, Satan, and Dan's father is God. And Dan likens himself unto Jesus Christ, who was betrayed by Judas, with his brother Ron, of course, fulfilling the role of Judas Iscariot. Delusions of grandeur much? I'm still trying to understand, and maybe uh, you are trying to understand yourself, <laughs> in the 16 years since you committed these acts, uh, what you did and why you did it. Mm -hmm. uh, at this date, this this long time after, mm -hmm. I hear no remorse in your voice. No, I don't. I don't have any remorse. You ever think that your niece would be 17 years old now or 18 years old and might be going on to college and having babies of her own and raising a family? You have no no thoughts about this at all, taking that child's life. No, I never have thought about that. You want to think about it now? Um, I thought about it while you said it. That's about as much as I think it's worth thinking about. And I don't it think there's any advantage in dwelling on unnecessary details. I, I try to avoid, whether it's intentionally I try to avoid, I don't, uh, I find that I don't bother. I think this fits in my personality trait, which is that I don't worry about consequences when I determine something's appropriate, so I don't feel there's much need to worry about alternatives and things like that, I guess. You don't ever second-guess your actions? Well, I wouldn't say I don't second-guess them, because I have, have had some good long talks with God about this, and I've been willing to... Uh, in fact, I, I had a good talk with God about I said, if, if this isn't your business, God, and I've done wrong, it's not because I did intentionally wrong. If, if I've done wrong, you need to let me know, and maybe I've gotten into a hole too deep to dig my way out of, but... I'll do whatever I can if you'll let me know that I've done wrong because uh, God knows that I never did anything intentionally wrong. And if I've been deceived, I need to know that if there's anything I can do about it. And uh, This, of course, is your opinion. You have no idea. You haven't gotten any written text from God or uh, anything else. This is just your, your inner I internal feelings. That's primarily what has been my guiding influence. And yeah. you've never gotten any messages, uh, however they come to you, saying that you did the right or wrong thing, or is God ignoring you? Not on that subject. Well, God didn't ignore me, because I feel like I got uh, to a comfortable place on that subject I was discussing with him at, when I finally felt uh, like I probably should address it. I had acknowledged, see, people, very few people ever considered that I have done wrong, or done right. <laughs> and uh, I thought, well, maybe I'm equally 
uh, an error to never think that I've done wrong. I better consider the possibility. So I have been through that. And you came to the conclusion that you did nothing wrong. And I was, wrong. I was able to resolve completely to my own satisfaction and comfort that it was God's business. And, and uh, I've been comforted in that. Where, have you had any contact with Alan since the murders? No, I've written to him, but he apparently isn't comfortable writing back to me, and that's fine. And you have no feelings at all for your brother's loss? Oh, oh, I wouldn't say that. Yeah, I realize he suffered, but I don't let myself... But that doesn't bother you? Well, uh, no, i be honest, I don't think it does bother me, no, because I kind of don't know whether it's because it's not supposed to bother me or because I won't let it bother me. I don't know. I... Do you think that Alan approved of what you did? Uh, no, I'm sure I, I, I have information now sufficient to understand that he does not approve of it, that he... Are you surprised that he allowed them to be in such close proximity and accessible to you to commit this act? I wouldn't be at all surprised. Like I say, I haven't talked to him, so I don't know for sure. But I, I presume, from what I've heard him say, through my mother, basically. He lived with my mother after that for a long time, and she shared some of his thoughts and feelings because he wouldn't talk to me personally, that he couldn't understand why I wouldn't repent. I remember that was the thing that really puzzled him because he loves me. He told me he loved me. Uh, you know, I did see him in the trial. He told me he loved me, and... And he was, when he was explaining to Mom, I remember her saying, why won't he repent? Why won't he repent? Because my brother loves me. And, uh, but asking for so, repentance is a little different than having anger for murdering his wife and baby. I, oh, you yeah. know, Do you understand the, why I have a hard time understanding what you Lafferty's say is what your thought processes are? I don't understand this. I don't think any normal, uh -huh. you know, people walking the street can understand how a person can let his brother say that I'm going to murder your wife and baby and not call the police or not do anything to intervene. Uh, you understand what I'm saying? I do, I do understand what you're saying. I, and I've done the best I can to try and put my mind into what Alan's thinking. So what, does Alan just think you were joking? Or no. if, and if he didn't think you were joking and you were serious, why wouldn't he have done everything humanly possible to protect his family from his murderous brother's ideas. Okay, the most specific reference I can return to is I sense that he, whether he believed it or not, was probably of the mind that it may be part of God's business. And I guess that, for that reason, I don't think he wanted to probably uh, say anything to law enforcement or something. That would be my best guess, but I don't so know. So he was going along with the God's business business in thinking that if this if this happens, it is okay. No, I don't think he would say that it was okay. Uh, or it's God's, but that must it's have God's him will. To some it's God's will. Then, if if you do uh, uh, fulfill this act that you had told him you were going to do, it would be God's will. Uh, I have to think that that thought must have run through his mind in some fashion. Does this make you think that maybe your brother's a little off? Uh, which, Alan? Yeah, that he would uh, allow his wife and baby to be murdered because of an be alleged funny. message from God or whoever. <laughs> you understand what, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm being serious. What, what, the reason I'm chuckling is to think that, to, I imagine myself saying that somebody else was off. That's what got me. Uh, I, I never thought about him being off because I guess maybe I'm so far off. In the Hulu series, Under the Banner of Heaven, the part of Dan Lafferty is played by Kurt Russell's son, Wyatt Russell, and he does a pretty good job of portraying that character. He is portrayed as being very emotional, very susceptible to anger. And even though I think that Wyatt Russell does a really good job of portraying the character of Dan Lafferty, it does not and cannot capture the true chillingness of Dan Lafferty as we listen to him in this interview from the year 2000 describe the murder of his sister-in-law and her 14-month-old baby girl that he himself committed as calmly and as dispassionately as if he were talking about an unusually colored bird that he happened to spot while walking to work that morning. That's what chills me to my bones. That's what's scary. Not ranting, not raving, but describing a brutal murder as calmly as an unimportant business transaction. Did you ever think you're off? <laughs> what? Do you ever think that you're off? You ever well, get the feeling I... that, gee whiz, maybe I'm, you know, I, I, I'm not really cinched down too tight here. Well, I've done I, some like... things that the, if the rest of the world, let me ask you this, Dan, if the rest of the world 
would look at you and look at the story and say, this guy has got a screw loose. Wouldn't you maybe think that this majority vote might have a basis in fact? <laughs> I have thought about it, yes. Uh, but what can you do? I mean, I like where I'm at. You're, I, it may be very, insanity. If I'm insane, I'm happy to be insane. You're, you're, you're pleased with who you are and what you've done. I'm not unhappy with who I am, no. What do you expect will happen to you next now that you've gone through this 16 years, you've been in prison, mm -hmm. you uh, have no remorse for the murders of, right. of Brenda and her, her child, and right. what do you think is going to happen to Dan Lafferty now? Well, uh, that's a good question. I uh, never would have expected to be in prison for as long as I have been. What'd you expect? First of all. What'd you think? Uh, I thought... Well, they're well, going to let you go and say, gee whiz, Dan, have a nice day? <laughs> no. What, 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 I, I made what it did pretty you think clear. Was, I mean, you say you don't care about consequences. Mm -hmm. What did you think was going to happen to you after you committed this act? Well, I made it clear. I represented myself, jurors and others who were present, that I said, my only interest is the kingdom of God. And the Lord said that when the kingdom comes, he'll have to open the prisons and get his children out. So I said, I can wait for the kingdom in prison as easily as I can out here. And then I was asked, so do you think God's going to come get you out of prison? I says, well, if he does, that'll be cool. And I guess that's primarily what my thought has been over the years, that I've hoped that somehow God would intervene and uh, bring me out of prison. I've used the example of Peter, who uh, had an angel come and deliver him from prison. And I said, maybe it'll happen like that, but I don't know. I'm only guessing. And, but in answer to your question, what I think will happen, I'll remain in prison until... And if God ever comes and takes me out of prison, that's all I can think. And that could be by natural causes or maybe at the hands of another inmate. Uh, oh, well, yeah, anything, I guess, is possible. I, I, I was more inclined to think that uh, hopefully it would be some miraculous means. Uh, especially, like I say, with what I think I understand now, uh, if, if, in fact, I am uh, the Elijah then there's an important part to be played by that individual in this in the whole story of of the of God's plan and so I can't imagine it being done from here in prison so therefore again I have to think that somehow there will be some intervention with God to fulfill that in your quiet darkest hours late at night early in the morning or whenever when you're you're introspective does it ever have a ever have a nagging thought in the back of your mind that no, maybe that. maybe you were not Elijah and then maybe you were nothing other than Dan Lafferty who wound up killing his sister-in-law and niece for no reason other than the fact that you had a feeling? Uh -huh. Well, that's been asked me a number of times, and I am honest enough to say, and this is, uh, this is something I had to kind of progress through. I don't know these things are true. I don't know there's a God. I'll be honest enough. That'll probably give you... That will be shocking enough statement to let you understand where I'm coming from. At this stage in the conversation, I find that quite shocking. Yeah, I thought it would be, but it, 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 uh, it will help me to explain what I'm trying to say here. Okay. I don't know much of anything. And the reason I say that's significant is, see, being raised in the LDS Church, we were taught to say, I know that this is the true church. I know that there's a Santa Claus, you know, and all these kinds of things. And we don't really know much of anything. I've come to understand in my analysis of things, we only know what we have experienced with our senses, our natural senses, our, the five, and, five senses primarily, right. the only things we can really say we know anything about. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that I'm in this Elijah. I don't know that there's a God. I don't know any of these things, but I have good feelings. I, I'm at a point now where I would be surprised tremendously if there's not a God. I'd be surprised now. I'm at a point now where I would really be surprised if I'm not Elijah. And, uh, but I don't know these things. And so therefore, that not knowing does leave room for wonderment. And there are times when, uh, I'll be honest, uh, that I think, well, maybe, maybe I am just insane. Maybe, but if I am, I think to myself, so what can I do about it? I don't know. I guess I'm not all that unhappy. I'm not extremely happy, but I'm more happy when I think about uh, the things that I hope will happen, which are, they may be just dreams and fairy dust and stuff. I don't know. It's just, it does make a lot of sense to me. I have good feelings about things.
We are rapidly winding down to the end of this interview with Dan Lafferty, but I have to comment that it is interesting that an individual such as Dan Lafferty, who believes so strongly in the revelation from God to kill his sister and niece, that he feels absolutely no remorse about it, even 16 years later, and apparently has never felt any remorse about it, and even goes so far as to say he's not ashamed of it, that Dan Lafferty would nevertheless mock his Mormon upbringing, where he was taught to testify testify that he knows that something is true. He knows the LDS church is true. He knows the Book of Mormon is true. He knows the president of the church is a prophet of God. That he will mock Mormons for such claims of absolute knowledge and certainty of things that they have had revealed to them by the Spirit, and yet try and distinguish himself as somebody who does not know any of these spiritual things. He says he doesn't know that he is Elijah. He says he doesn't know that his murders were directed by God, and yet he would be very surprised to find out differently. I sense that he is making this distinction in order to present himself as more rational than he may actually be, because I cannot fathom how somebody could commit a double murder in the name of God without absolutely knowing that it came from God. If there were any question in his mind, why would he have committed the murders in the first place? This seems to me part of the rewriting of history that sometimes happens in a person's life, not only to justify things they may have done in the past, but also to make themselves look better in the present. It is also, of course, possible that he is in the process of trying to deal with the question of how it is that God could have commanded him to commit these murders, and yet God has not intervened to release him from prison in the 16 years since. It is now 2022, 22 years after this interview was given. One can only wonder what has gone through his mind in regards to this in the meantime, and why hasn't God released him from prison even now? And I personally wonder if Dan Lafferty has ever considered another story in the Book of Mormon, from the Book of Alma, chapter 30, where it talks about an Antichrist named Corihor, who went about teaching false doctrine and leading the souls of many away from God and God's church, and was ultimately trodden down even until he was dead. This from Alma, chapter 30, verse 60. And thus we see the end of him who perverteth the ways of the Lord. And thus we see that the devil will not support his children at the last day, but doth speedily drag them down to hell. It has now been 38 years since Dan Lafferty committed these murders, and God has not lifted one finger to rescue him or get him out of prison. And so I wonder if perhaps by this time he has begun to think that maybe it wasn't God directing him at all, but actually it was the devil who was directing him to commit these murders. Because according to the Book of Mormon, God does stand up for those who do his will. God does bless and protect and deliver those who do his will. It is the devil, on the other hand, who will not support his children at the last day. And this connection is brought only more sharply into focus by the fact that even though Corihor claimed that it was an angel of God who taught him these doctrines and things to teach and do, he admits at the end, shortly before his ignominious death, that it was the devil who had appeared to him as an angel of God, and it was the devil who had deceived him. Uh, if you were let out of prison tomorrow, uh -huh. and you could assume a life as a, a citizen, Mm -hmm. What would that be? Um, I was recently wrote to my children and told them what I would do is I'd get me a job. My, I think my highest preference would be get a job as a, a bagger at a grocery store and just keep a mundane job, uh, survive the best I can out there. I wouldn't want to become a doctor again. That was too complicated. Too many um, uh, secret combinations involved. And I like to be in, involved in something that has low stress levels and just... Go to work on a five to nine, nine to five job and go home at night and relax and go back to work. Something simple like that. That would be my ideal job. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I was going to talk about going before the board, by the way. They, they like to, if they ever are going to release you. So when you talk about release, I had to think through this. I, okay. The board likes to hear what their, your plans would be. And I jokingly said, uh, I'd like to do something legitimate. So I think I'd go to Nevada and become a, uh, uh, run a, a whorehouse and uh, appear legitimate and sell pot out the back door and have all my girlfriends uh, in the work there and uh, have a big playground in the back for all the kids. Uh, that would be pretty ideal in my mind. <laughs> 
but more realistically uh, well, that's good as answer any i suppose that you're you're in your condition dan would you have a last quick question for a short answer because i'm really out of time okay would you have any any thoughts to tell somebody who thinks that they are getting these kinds of messages to commit this kind of an act well uh i've had that question posed to me before and I, all i can say is i wouldn't you know people have got to do what they feel is right i i don't uh, i would i couldn't see myself trying to prevent something someone from doing something thought they thought was right as long as it didn't involve me i guess but i really don't know that i'd have any kind of useful advice there i'm big on free agency so that opens up pretty even if that agency would take the life of another individual well here's the here's the problem what if it is god's business if someone says they think god's directing them to do something i if, surely wouldn't want to be uh, standing in god's way that's not a good place to be and what if it isn't and if it isn't then i guess consequences will follow you say oops Dan, uh, I'm out of time. Thank you for uh, visiting with us and sharing this time. I, I hope this has uh, helped uh, explain an awful lot uh, as to what goes on and what has happened. I've, I'm glad to have had a chance to do it. Ron and Dan Lafferty were arrested several weeks after the killings and convicted of murder in separate trials. The jury that heard Ron Lafferty's case sentenced him to be executed. He is currently on Utah's death row. The jury that heard Dan Lafferty's case could not agree on a sentence. Dan Lafferty is currently serving life without the possibility of parole at the Utah State Prison. So that concludes the interview by Tom Barberry of Dan Lafferty on the 16th anniversary of the double murder committed by Dan Lafferty and as recounted in Under the Banner of Heaven. Thank you for listening. I invite anyone with comments to make about this interview to write them in the comments section below. That's about all for tonight. Until next time, this is Radio Free Mormon, signing off the air.